right? Let's take a look at today's message, and it's going to be one that I, I need to establish uh, with setting it up with an introduction because this message is going to be different than any message that you've heard me preach in the divine worship session because we're going to combine both the plan of salvation, the inerrancy of scripture, the inerrancy of scripture. And whenever you hear us use that word inerrant, we're speaking about the fact that the Bible is without error, uh, the immutable word of God, and then we're going to be dealing with history. So today is when we begin that journey. We begin that journey in talking about how, in many ways, this is at the core of when Christianity took a wrong turn. This is the core of when Christianity took a wrong turn. Now, if you're interested in the message that we will present today, I invite you to reach out to me at Pastor T dot ahc at gmail.com pastor t dot ahc at gmail.com this morning we're going to touch on some historical facts they are verifiable this is not conjecture this is not seventh day adventist theology this is historical fact we're going to walk through it you're going to be introduced to some theological terms that may be new for you. You're going to be introduced to some historical figures that you might not have known before. You're going to be introduced to some transactions and transitions in the historical period that actually begins moving Rome from imperial Rome to papal Rome. And then finally, I would like to draw your attention to the reality that there is a passage of scripture that is applicable to everything that we will discover today, and that is found in Ecclesiastes. And in Ecclesiastes, it says, there's nothing new under the sun. So we want to encourage you to look for the parallels of what happened then at the time that we will discuss many millennia ago, but at the same time is literally happening right now before our very eyes. Let's pray again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessed privilege that we have to study your word, especially the prophetic word of God. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would awaken our minds to grasp the connections between what was and what is and what will be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Christian's security is in Scripture. The Christian's security is in Scripture. In a t at a time in religion, when Christian religion has taken everyone to the emotional and the ethereal, the Bible reminds us that our security is not in how we feel, but in what we know. So we're going to go through several passages this morning to help us to recognize how we should understand being secure in Christ. In Psalm 119, verses 4 through 6, Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. O oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Foundation stones. These are foundation stones of our faith. Not a denomination. These are foundation stones of our faith as Christians. Psalm 119, verses 9 and 10, and then we're going to also read verse 11. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I, what everybody, sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11, thy word, we all know this passage, thy word have I, what everybody, Hid in mine heart that I might not do what? Sin against thee. So these are passages that are literally foundation stones of how we are to understand our relationship with God. Let's continue. Psalm 119, verse 142. And do you also take note how many passages are coming out of or how many foundation stones are coming out of the 119th division of the Psalm? Psalm 119, verse 42. By the way, the longest chapter in the Bible. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Thy law is the truth. Thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are what? truth. All right. So 
we're beginning to see the correlation between the commandments and also the law and how they are the embodiment of truth. Let's go even further into Psalm, Psalm 25 and verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. These are the sure foundations of our faith. These are the sure foundations. These are the kinds of stones, if you will, the foundations that will help us to remain like a solid rock. Now, Psalm 119, verse 1. Notice what it says. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Now, I want to take our minds in the direction of the Bible that Christ and the apostles would have used. Many of us wonder what Bible do they, did they use. And this is going to be very important as we look forward into where we're going today in the message. Because if we understand what Bible they use, we will understand their reference point. We will understand their, under, their comprehension of truth. We will grasp what they understood as being the immutable and inerrant word of God. So the Bible of Christ and the apostles, all right? Luke chapter 24 and verse 32. And this is where we're going to begin to not only learn more scriptures that define the scriptures that they understood as the Bible, but also what historically is identified as Hebrew scripture. This is important. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and he opened to us the scriptures. Now, most of us would think that when the Bible is using that terminology, open to us the scripture, we would think that he's referring to, or the writer Luke is referring to the Bible that we have. It is not the Bible that we have. And too often today, God's people don't rightly divide the word of truth and they assume certain things. So let's go a little bit further. Search the scriptures. Jesus said these words, for in them ye think ye have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. What scriptures testified of him? Let's go on a little bit further. These are the scriptures of Paul. Paul referred to the scriptures. What does the Bible say? And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days, that means three weeks of labor, reasoned with them out of the scriptures. What scriptures did he reason with them out of? All right. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 15. And Paul writes to Timothy. And he references the fact that Timothy has grown up knowing the scriptures. But what scriptures did Timothy know? That's the question. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. What makes them holy? How do we know that they're holy? And how do we know what the scriptures were that they read that were holy? which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.15. Now it's time for us to do the homework. Let's go behind the curtain, as you often hear me reference. Let's obtain the historical context of Scripture. Let's understand what Scripture is that they knew to be Scripture, that they understood to be the Word of God. Because they did not have the Bible that we have, what Bible did they have, all right? Note this. This is from Flavius Josephus. Now, Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian, is actually writing about 100 AD. Note this, note this. For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us. So I want to go through these, uh, these sentences very carefully. Note what he says. Now, he's speaking in the context of an academic environment, a Hellenistic, if you've never heard that term before, it just happens to deal with those issues or those teachings or those philo philosophical leanings that point back to Greece Hellenistic, Helen, remember Helen of Troy, all right, that's Hellenistic, that's how the Greeks identified themselves, and one of the things that deeply impacted 
the Jews at Jesus' time and kept them from understanding the Bible and seeing the Bible as really revealing Christ is that they had a Hellenistic mind. Today, we have a very secular mind. Today, we have a materialistic mind. Today, we have minds that are impacted and infected with and affected by evolution. So you have all of these different things that affect the mind that thereby, thereby intrude on our understanding of the Word of God. So when we look at the Word of God, we often go to the Word of God presupposing what it is saying. And then that's where you get people who will say, well, I don't think that it means that. Well, I don't see that. And the reason that they don't see it is because they see it through minds that, were, that are already jaded, colored, and turned in a particular direction. But notice that Flavius Josephus now compares himself to the Greeks. And notice that he pulls the Jewish people uh, far away from the Hellenistic mind. So note this. For we have not an innumerable multitude of books among us. Well, what is the comparison? He's saying, remember what, uh, what was said to the Apostle Paul when he was being examined? I don't remember if it was Felix or Griffith, and, and the statement was made, much learning have made thee mad. And that statement was made because of the times in which they were living. Well, let's take, another, let's take another statement. The statement was made by Pilate when he was talking to Jesus. And, and he asked Jesus, what is truth? And they were asking these questions because the Hellenistic mind did not believe that there was anything concrete, that there was anything fixed like truth. But isn't that the same thing we see today? Isn't that where people's minds are today? So there really isn't anything new under the what? Under the sun. So listen to this. He also cites the fact, C-I-T-E-S, cites the fact that the philosophical books of the Greeks disagree from and contradict one another. This is as the Greeks have, all right? Now, the brackets, when you see the brackets, that's applied. That means I've inserted that. But only 22 books. So he states that the Hebrews only have 22 books. So the question is raised, and I'm going to see if you know your Bible. How many books in the Old Testament? How many books in the Bible? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all right? How many books in the New Testament? 27, all right? Who said that? 27, was that Elder Asamoah or Brother Paul? Amen, Brother Paul, all right, you're correct. So if you have 27 books in the New Testament, how many books in the Old Testament? I'm gonna see who's fast with math. 39, all right, there you go. All right, so now, there are 39 books in the Old Testament according to the Bibles that we carry. How many books did, they, did he say that they had? then we have a challenge, don't we? Where did the other, how many? Thank you. How many did the other 17, where did they come from? Hmm, okay. All, see, all of this is important. Note this, which contain the records of all the pastimes which are justly believed to be divine. So even Josephus, who did not, to my knowledge and studying, history did not become a Christian, he still had the understanding that the Old Testament that the Jews contained, or that they held rather, it contained the word of God. Notice he uses the word divine. Now notice this, and of them five belong to Moses. Okay? Now we call that today the Pentateuch, all right? Which contain his laws and the traditions of the origin of mankind till his death. So did he just give you an overview, an overview or summary of the time period that it covers? The what? The origin of mankind? What is that? The creation. Genesis 1 and 2, all right? Till his death. That's Deuteronomy. All right, let's go further. Note this. The interval of time was little short of 3,000 years. He's walking it out for us. So let's pay attention. But as to the time from the death of Moses till the reign of Artaxerxes, 
king of Persia, who reigned after Xerxes, the prophets who were after Moses wrote down what was done in their times in 13 books. Is he walking it out for us? All right, note this. The remaining four books contain hymns to God. So what should we be singing? Hymns to God, all right? It's in the Bible. Hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of human life. What would that be? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, you get the idea? Okay, it is true our history have been written since Artaxerxes very particularly, but have not been esteemed of the like authority with the former by our forefathers, because there has not been an exact succession of prophets since that time. In other words, it hasn't been consistent, has not been an exact succession. How firmly we have given credit to these books of our own nation is evident by what we, what? By what we do. So he says, if you want to know how we hold these books in esteem, look at our lives, and if you don't think we believe in the books, look at us, because we follow the books. Isn't that what used to be said of Seventh-day Adventists? That we are people of the, of the book. All right, well, now I want you to follow this, okay? And where references are supplied, take note of them. For, for during so many ages as have already passed, no one has been so bold as either to add anything to them. Now this is important. Now, this speaks boldly against people who want to suggest that the Bible has been changed. So Flavius, Flavius Josephus, Flavius Josephus, makes it clear around 100 A.D. that nothing has been added to the Old Testament. Wow. But notice this. Or to make any change in them, but it has become natural to all Jews immediately and from their very birth to esteem these books to contain what? Divine doctrines. And we've discussed what doctrines are. What are they? They're teachings, divine teachings. So if they're divine teachings, they're teachings of whom? God, all right? Or I should say of whose? And to persist in them and if occasion be willing to do what? To die for them to die for the scriptures. Does that, does that totally turn your understanding of their commitment? Okay, so let's look at what that looks like, all right? So let's note the distinctions in the numerical structure. This is important. This is important because we identified how many books in the Old Testament? Okay, are you staying with me today? All right, do I need to make it colder? All right? No? Okay. All right. That would, that would really wake you up, wouldn't it? All right. So now, how many books have we identified in the Old Testament? 39. 39. I knew that would get you going. All right. So, but he said there are how many? 22. He said that there are 22. We say that there are 39. Let's go to school. Here we go. Around 100 AD, Josephus plainly states that the contents of the Old Testament was written between the time of Moses and the days of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, which or who reigned from 465 to 424 BC. Remember, you're going south when you go to BC. You're headed south, all right? Then you're going north when you go to AD. All right, now, according to Josephus, the Jews recognized how many books? 22 books as the scriptures of the Jewish Bible. Since Protestant Bibles, modern Protestant Bibles, list 39 books in the Old Testament, why is there a difference in the number of the books? The answer is simple. It's actually simple. Note this. The Jews group the books differently. In a typical Jewish printing of the scriptures, the arrangement is as follows. The law, five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We're together so far? If we're together so far, say amen. amen. This is where they make their distinction when it comes to, the rec to recognizing the prophets. The prophets, they identify, believe it or not, Joshua, Samuel, not two books, First and Second Samuel, 
Kings, not two books, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and then the book of the 12. They call it the book of the 12. They group Hosea to Malachi together in one book. We call them the minor prophets. They call it the book of the 12. Here's a question for you. Would it have been interesting for Jesus when he called 12 apostles, which corresponded with the 12 patriarchs of Israel and also corresponded with the 12, the book of the 12? Isn't that interesting? So the 12 or the number 12 is more important in the Jewish tradition and economy and understanding than it is to us. Note this. Then they have the third grouping called the writings, the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Judges, Ecclesiastes. And notice Ruth and Judges are together. Okay. Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah are what? One book. And then you have Chronicles, which is what? Also one book. That makes 10 books. So out of those, you receive the number 22. All right? Now, it's important that we understand that the word of God that they read from are the 22 books. So let's start there. The 22 books that they studied were that which we have just learned about. So those were the 22 books. So when Jesus opened up the scriptures, he was opening up the 22 books. When Jesus speaks about that the scriptures testify of me, he's talking about the 22 books. All right, we're all together now. However, now that we go to the New Testament, we're going to be introduced to something that runs counter to the 22 books because the only Bible, important point, the only Bible that the New Testament teachers, the apostles, had to give to the newly formed church, the Christians, were in reality the 22 books. The 22 books were the scriptures of the New Testament church. Remember, the church didn't have scriptures from the apostles yet. Okay, now all of this is important because we can't understand the issue of apostasy unless we understand the context of what they understood. Now, by the way, did you notice how many times the law was referred to in Psalm 119? Just that one division? Okay, so tell me this. What then do you think God is emphasizing as a criteria by which he is expecting his people to live? The law, all right? But not to be saved, but an indication, as Josephus mentioned, that look at our lives. Our lives are in harmony with the book or books that we believe in that are divinely inspired. So now Paul, he comes along, and at the very beginning, at the very beginning, he begins to identify influences on Christianity. Now, this is not influences within Christianity yet, but if you follow the scriptures carefully, you're going to see that Paul makes a distinction. There are influences on Christianity, which means that's external, and then there are influences in Christianity, which means it's what? Internal. All right. So watch the distinction that Paul is going to make. Acts chapter 20 and verses 28 through 29. Now, this is Luke that records this. And so Paul says, for I know this, that after my departure, what does he mean my departure? After my what? My death. All right. After my death, after my departure, savage wolves will come in, come in. So if they're coming in, they have to be where? Outside, all right? So that is obviously a direct connection to forces where? Outside of the church. Note that. Not sparing the flock, external forces. But then he talks about internal forces. Also from among yourselves, men will arise speaking perverse things. Is that an external struggle or internal? That's internal. So now the church, he is a gone on record as saying the church is going to get hit 
on the outside or from the outside and also hit from where? The inside. It's going to rock and it's going to get hit. It's going to take blows. This is why Jesus says that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He meant you're going to be in a battle, external, internal. All right, let's go a little bit further, all right? The early church fathers, let's talk about how we arrived at the New Testament scriptures because if the church is being hit from within, then how the scriptures are being formed becomes important. In other words, nobody could just sit down and say, Hmm, I think this ought to be identified as part of the Bible because they already had 22 books. So if they already had 22 books, you couldn't just grab a letter from the Apostle Paul and say, that ought to be in with the 22 books. Because remember, most of the New Testament Christians were of what ethnicity? Jews. They were Jews. And so when they joined the Christian faith, because they accepted Jesus Christ, they then had to agree, mentally agree, that these 22 books, which shouldn't be tampered with, remember Josephus said, they should not be tampered with, they should not be, nothing has been added, nothing has been taken away. He says, then how in the world would any of them dare to say, we can just blindly or just, just carelessly add to the 22 books. There had to be something that created a process. So let's identify it. The early church fathers, such as Polycarp, we talked about him on the uh, Consolation Ministries line. He was a bishop, not to be understood as bishops are today. He was a bishop of Smyrna. He was a bishop of Smyrna. He was martyred for his faith. He was 80 some years old when he was martyred. They put him at the stake, they sought to burn him, and it would not burn. Do you all remember the story? We talked about it. He would not burn. So someone rushed him and stabbed him because he would not burn. Okay, well, is that any different than Tyndall? Remember William Tyndall was killed, but because he was a Roman Catholic priest, their, their criteria was he could not be burned at the stake, so they strangled him and then burned him. Interesting, but keep all of this information in mind. So you have Polycarp, now these are some names that you might not be familiar with, but I'm gonna run through them. So you have Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, uh, Eusebius, uh, and the Thaint, a Thaint, forget that, Jerome, and, uh, <laughs> and Augustine, <laughs> forget that. I just, I could not work through that one, okay? All right. Uh, because, because, you know, I've done this online because when I see that, I know it's Greek and it's alpha and it's alpha and it's alpha. Those are your three A's. And I'm trying to figure out how would they pronounce that? And I just, I, I can't go there. But anyway, all right. So an, an, an Augustine led in the slow, careful acceptance of a book as scripture. Now, let, let me share this with you. This Augustine is different than the St. Augustine of Roman Catholicism. You got to keep them separate. There were two Augustines. Okay, one was actually pronounced Augustine, and the other one was pronounced Augustine. I can handle those two, okay? That one I can't, all right? Now, they led in the slow, careful acceptance of a book of scripture. Contrary to popular bestsellers as, this is going back a little ways, the Da Vinci Code, okay? The church never had a meeting now, I want you to note this. This is so important. The church never had a meeting. All right? I want to repeat that. Because those of us who believe that the church would get together and have business meetings like we do now, the church never had a meeting where the scriptures were autocratically decided upon and then forced upon the rest of the church. Isn't that profound? Because it tells us that they were very, very careful in embracing the New Testament writings. Okay? Let's go a little bit further. Instead, the books belonging to Scripture that we have now, note this, note this, and this is important because notice the heading is identifying the culprits, identifying the culprits. The books belonging to Scripture were determined by long and continuous use long 
and continuous use by both church leaders and, okay, many books were accepted due to the great influence the book was shown to have over the lives of the people. Some books were accepted because the church members themselves could testify how God used the book to draw many to him and change their what? Their lives, all right? Now, note this. Many books, talking about in New Testament times, were rejected because they supported pagan doctrines. Now, it's interesting that that's a point because how many times have we talked about it on Consolation Ministries, how we have so willingly embraced pagan doctrines in the church today without a filter. But their filters were so strong that they would not accept many of the teachings that were coming to them, even though it was written, and they would say, I'm sorry, but I have found something over here which is akin to a pagan practice. This can't be divinely inspired. So they were critical enough, rational enough, detailed enough in their thinking that they would say, I'm sorry, if it does not totally, completely, and thoroughly harmonize with the word of God, then guess what? It's not the word of God. Now, that is the way that we are supposed to be. I continue. Many taught strange doctrines that promoted the Gnostic concept of salvation. So my question is, would you know Gnosticism if it was a foot in the church today? Would you know Gnosticism? Most of God's people wouldn't know Gnosticism. In fact, how many of you have never heard of Gnosticism? Raise your hand. This is the first time you've been introduced to it. Gnosticism, all right? There's one hand, all right? The others, no, two hands, all right, praise the Lord. So this is interesting. Now, I want you to take note of this. This is, an honest, this is an honest response. Here is a person that's been in the church for many years, new term. There's a person new to the church, new term. Now, a new term for a new person in the church, but a new term for someone who's been in the church for a long time. That means that we have not been doing our job. Gnosticism is alive and well. Okay? We're going to introduce you to Gnosticism, all right? So some of the, some of the writings at that time had Gnostic concepts of salvation through what's called hidden knowledge. Okay, that's how you get to all the secret societies. The secret societies start with the premise that there's a knowledge that they have that everybody doesn't have. That's how you get to the, the, the Rosicrucian, the, the Rosicrucians, the, uh, the, the Masons, the Knights of Malta. All of those groups are structured off of the idea of having secret knowledge. Okay, some books taught that Christ was not really human and did not really die on the cross, such books could not be accepted by the church because they were contrary to evidence. All right? Now, so let's talk about Gnosticism. And, and, and Gnosticism or Gnosticism is very interesting because you're going to see something in the three parts of the definition that actually is heard in Christianity today. All right? All right, now, let me step back so you want to take the photograph. And again, again, we will share this with you if you just email us. All right, here's the basic tenets, all right, basic tenets of Gnosticism. The world and our bodies were created by an incompetent lesser God. But we contain a spark of divinity. And Jesus provided us with the knowledge to free it. That's Gnosticism. Now, let me ask you this. Just from that first sentence, is this Christian doctrine or serpent doctrine? Okay, where's the serpent doctrine? That we have within us a what? Spark of what? Divinity. So if we have a spark of divinity, go back to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and what did Satan say to them? You shall be as knowing both good and evil. There it is. So when you see just a little poison in the pot, 
leave the pot, okay? Requirements. Followers had to have the time to pursue and incorporate this special knowledge. Literacy may have also helped. Here's the appeal. Here's the appeal of it. This is why, this is why Hollywood is filled with Gnostic believers. Most of us don't recognize that watching movies and those programs produced by Hollywood, that every one of them is laced with, laced with this philosophical premise, Gnosticism, all right? Here it is. Gnosticism explained the world's hardships and people's feelings of not belonging to it, but at the same time assured them that redemption is within whose power? Their power. Their power. Not Christ within them. And in fact, if you listen to some of the more prominent individuals, for an example, like Oprah Winfrey, she frequently mentions the fact that there is power within her to do whatever she wants to do. That's Gnosticism. And there are people who are drinking that up and they're saying, man, that's how she became a billionaire. I want that power. And she'll say, the power is, is within you. And I have seen it, little excerpts of it, where she has made the statement. She says, you need to tap into that power within you. That's Gnosticism. Okay? All right. By the way, here's your reference. It's an excerpt from Troy Brooks' book, Which Group Do You Fall Under Today? All right, now. The culprits. So let's talk about the other culprits. Gradually, the need to have a definite list of the inspired scriptures became apparent. So in other words, because there was false theology, false doctrine coming into the church, the church had to lift up a standard. Heretical movements were rising, each one choosing its own selected scriptures. That would have been a problem. But I have a question for you today. Do we still have groups that have their own Bibles? So do the Jehovah Witnesses have their own Bibles? Do the Church of Jesus Christ have their own Bibles? Okay, Church of Christ scientists, do they have their own Bibles? Do Roman Catholics have their own Bible? Okay, so let me ask you this. How much has really changed? Not much, okay? So with each one choosing its own selected scriptures, including such documents as the Gospel of Thomas, you ever heard of that one? The Shepherd of Hermas, the Apocalypse of Peter, and the Epistle of Barnabas. You've heard of those? If you have Roman Catholic background, you certainly have heard of them, all right? Now, Paul noticed that the enemy was at work trying to confuse the believers with false doctrines in the church. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, all right? Now, I'm going to give you two different terms that might be new for you. These terms I know, even though they're Greek, all right? And I know them because they were hammering us in seminary, okay? Pseudepigrapha. And the pseudepigrapha is the pseudepigrapha because you don't have a P sound in, in Greek, right? So the PS, it's, it's that kind of sound. So the, the pseudepigrapha refers to a perspective or theology of a classification of books. And so note this. Some of the books outside of the canon are called the pseudepigrapha. Now, this is not to be confused with the next group, but let's just focus on this. The Oxford American Dictionary. Now, this is not a theological dictionary. This is just the Oxford American Dictionary. It notes that the, the word originated in the 17th century. Okay, now tell me, when would that have been? Think about it prophetically. Think about it prophetically now. So when you, this word comes on the scene in the 1700s, I mean in the 17th century, pardon me, which would be the 1600s, what is that? chronologically in prophetic un unrolling of the, of the scroll. What's happening? This, well, not, it's the Reformation. So the Reformation is putting a handle on these false doctrines. From the Greek pseudo, pseuda, pig or false, which literally means false title. 
Now, that's a word that you're probably not as familiar with as this word, apocrypha. You're familiar with that one? Okay, you've heard that one, the apocrypha? Okay, this is important. This is important. Now, I'm going to share with you why the apocrypha is especially important today because many Bibles that are now being sold within so-called Christian bookstores are carrying the apocrypha with the Word of God because Catholicism has that much influence on what's being printed and thereby people naively are picking up Bibles thinking that this too is divinely inspired. Okay, the Apocrypha, all right? Another group of books often called the lost books is the Apocrypha. While the pseudepigraphal books were written within 200 years of the time of Christ, centered on the New Testament period, the Apocryphal books were long after the original Old Testament scriptures were completed. The Apocryphal books are rejected. I want you to watch this because this is where it gets real clear of where Christianity begins to take the wrong turn. I want you to watch this very carefully. The apocryphal books are rejected by both Jewish and Protestant scholars, but widely accepted by Roman Catholic scholars. The books include portions that support what? Justification, excuse a typo, justification for both what? Suicide and what? Assassination, lying if the end justifies the prayers for the belief in and worship of. Okay, so that's how they get to be classified as what? Apocrypha, right? All right, I'll clean that up before I send it out to you. All right, now, so Christianity was now compromised. Christianity was compromised because false teaching came in in a written context, and the Apostle Paul saw it. And remember that he already spoke to that in the book of Acts where he says that there will arise after my departing grievous wolves attacking the flock. That's coming against the church. And then he says, even among yourselves shall men arise with what? False teachings, drawing away disciples after themselves, so we have an external force and we have an internal force. So we've seen the external force because these are things that are really were coming against the church that were starting to creep up in the church, but it became fertile ground for Satan to then work inside of the church to usurp the plan of Christ and therefore, thereby, I should say, thereby deconstruct the church of Christ as he intended for it to be. Now that's a mouthful, so let me... Give it back to you in sound bites. Satan found out that if he could plant the weed in the garden, that the weeds would eventually take over the garden while, while they were asleep. So the saints were asleep, and the weeds started taking over the garden. And this is how he did it, all right? The inroads of false doctrines and paganism, all right? First of all, we have to understand the things that we're going to see. So let's get a working vocabulary. First of all, let me introduce you to a word you might not be familiar with. It's a new word to some of you. It's called syncretism. Everybody, let's say that together. Syncretism, all right? Now, syncretism is the amalgamation. We've typically only thought of that in the context of something sexual, but that's not the meaning of the word. Amalgamation of truth and error, all right? amalgamation of truth and error. It's the blending of truth with error, all right? Now, we also want to introduce you to the beginning of ecumenism. Now, most of us believe that ecumenism is a recent phenomena. It is, a, it is not a recent phenomena. It actually goes back to the apostolic or actually post-apostolic period, which means not long after the apostles had died, there was actually a move by Satan to bring all religions together. Interesting, right? Especially in the context of last night's presentation. All right? Right? So now after last night's presentation, we actually have some stepping stones to build on. So ecumenism, the 40 religions signing a, a pact or an agreement with the papacy in Rome 
uh, which transpired on August, October the 4th, really is a continuation of this initiative to make one religion out of many beliefs. And I'm going to take you back to a time that not only were we not a twinkle in our parents' eyes, we weren't even a twinkle in our great, 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 great grandparents' eyes, all right? So let's go back to that time. In Matthew 24, Jesus refers to pagan Rome's persecution of God's people and destruction of literal Jerusalem. He was speaking of a type of which papal Rome is the antitype. Papal Rome, like pagan Rome, is an abominable system, a false religion that persecutes spiritual Jerusalem. Now, this is Matthew 24. God's worldwide people, like the emperors of old, the pope possesses religious and secular powers. Now, this is talking about the system. So listen to this. Pagan Rome's pantheon of gods is replaced by Mary and the saints. Okay? Now, let's go a little bit further. All right? This is all historically documented, folks. This is not... Samuel Thomas, this is not Seventh-day Adventist doctrine. This is history. I'm reading history. Now, I want you to see the transition from imperial Rome to papal Rome. And here are your dates. So pay very special attention, close attention to your dates, because this is when Christianity began to make the wrong turn. Follow me carefully. When the power of pagan Rome declined, when did it decline? Between 351 A.D. and 476 A.D., the power of papal Rome increased as the church accumulated more power and influence. When the emperor Constantine, 306 to 337 A.D., blended, listen to this, he blended paganism and Christianity into one. Now, see, we always want to talk about a seven-day Adventist. We talk about the fact he changed the day of worship. That's actually not accurate. That's not accurate. He started the move toward changing the day of worship. He did not change the day of worship, and we're going to show that to you historically in just a moment. So note this, that that occurred around 321 A.D., Rome became the religious capital of the world. Now, this is before the fall of the Roman Empire. So in 321 AD, in fact, when he pulls the, together the religions around a particular day, he is actually bringing together paganism and Christianity. What the apostles had fought to keep out of Christianity, Constantine opened the door and brought it into Christianity. Note this, the transfer of the emperor's residence to Constantinople. Now, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that Rome ceased to be the center of the Roman Empire. And during this period, Rome was not the center of the Roman Empire. This is very important. Rome actually moved its empire's headquarters to Constantinople. Constantinople is today Istanbul, Turkey. In fact, you will see Constantine's name in the name of the city, Constantinople. See it there? So Constantine's name is literally in the town. He named the city. See, when you're emperor, you can do those things. He named the city after himself. So he took the political power, the imperial power of Rome, moved it over to the, the, the core of what was then the Roman Empire because the European side of the Roman Empire was crumbling. It was crumbling. Why was it crumbling? Because the barbarian tribes had already started rising up. The Germanic tribes, the French tribes, all of the, uh, the other northern tribes of, of the northernmost part of Europe, they began to rise up. They began to coalesce and build a federation. It was a period of time that it took them to actually come and conquer physical Rome. But at the end of the day, all of this upheaval all over the empire, he couldn't control it anymore. It was not what it was before. So they were considered barbarians because they were conquered by Rome. Okay, so Rome was the one who tagged them. But note this, it was a sad blow to the prestige of Rome when he moved it to Constantinople. And at the time, one might have predicted her speedy decline. 
That's not what happened. You would have thought that Rome would have declined. Rome did not decline. The development of the church and the growing authority of the bishop of Rome or the pope gave her a new lease on life, made her again the capital, this time the religious capital of the world. Now, we know that from Daniel chapter 2 because remember when you come down the legs of iron, the iron is the one uh, element that does not dissipate or change, but it simply blends into the feet iron mixed with clay, all right? Now, this is where it becomes important for us to understand what really took place and when Christianity took a wrong turn. When Constantine moved his capital to Constantinople in 330 AD, the Pope inherited the power, the prestige, and even the titles of the Roman emperors. Now, if you were a part of the uh, presentations that we did at our previous assignment, in our previous church that we pastored, note this, that something that most people miss is Pontifex Maximus was not a Roman term. It actually began with the Babylonians, and it transferred to Pergamos. Remember when Jesus wrote to the church at Pergamos? He said to the church at Pergamos, he said, you are where Satan's seat is. Okay? So where does Satan's seat exist? Well, Satan's seat exists wherever Pontifex Maximus was because that term actually is indicative of what the Babylonians gave themselves, but not the citizenry of the Babylonians, but the priesthood of the Babylonians. And so when the Babylonian empire was overthrown, it eventually it, it winds its way over to uh, Pergamos. And then when Pergamos was overrun, then Rome took it. The Caesars used it, and then eventually the Pope at Rome. And if you want to know if it continues, all you have to do is look inside of St. Peter's Basilica, and there you will see this three-tiered crown and keys that cross. That's the symbol, okay? Now, we're not going to get that deep into it now. We'll talk, touch on that later. But this is just for us to see how Christianity becomes infiltrated by paganism. Notice this. Pontifex Maximus is a pagan title that means bridge builder between heaven and earth. Who is the true bridge builder between heaven and earth? Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question. Do we now have a usurper of Jesus Christ? Okay, so let's, let's not just Think about the Sunday issue. Let's understand at all levels, this is cutting at Christ, who is the only begotten Son of God. Now, let's go a little bit further, all right? So now, how did, how did Constantine blend, blend, and this, this is toward our end, so note this. How did he blend these two worlds, the two worlds of church and state? How did he bring together all of the world's religions? Go back to October the 4th. This, this, is, this, is, this is like, we know this is divine providence that this series is happening right here, right now. I, we planned this. I had no idea that there was going to be a meeting October the 4th. But the Lord told me way back at the end of August, top of September, start the series. And the Lord had already given me this series, but he, he asked me to tweak it and to update it and so on and so forth. And note this, note this. I want you to see how this works. Because on October the 4th, 40 world religions came together at the Vatican in Rome and signed a paper that said that they were united and they were united on giving primary focus as a result of COP26 that the world would be united, come together as one for the purpose of environmental concerns and that the world needed a day of rest. 
Who's leading the discussion on the day of rest? Rome. And if Rome is leading the day of rest discussion, which day is she going to choose? Okay, good deal. So now that you figured that out, look at this. So Sunday was another work day in the Roman Empire until March the 7th, 321. Roman Emperor Constantine issued a civil decree. Now this is important because he does not issue a religious decree. Are you with me? It's a civil decree. So does that make it a point of the state or a point of the religion? The state. But who did Francis bring together at the Vatican first? The religious leaders, what was the date? October the 4th. Then who did he bring together October 10 and 11? Political leaders of the world. So the religious leaders of the world, 40 religions represented, come together and they sign an agreement on the basis of unity on environmental concerns. Then he pulls together six to ten day, six to seven days later, they come together, political leaders. Now you have the state supporting religion. Note the sequence. This is a different sequence than we saw in 321. In 321, we saw the state setting the template for the church. This time we see the church establishing the template for the state. Is everybody with me so far? All right, so watch this. So he made Sunday a day of rest from what? Labor. Okay, what is the hook this time? It is a day of rest from environmental concerns, environmental pressures, stress, giving the earth a day of rest. Here it was rest from labor. Now it's being promoted as a day of rest for the earth, for our common good. You're with me. That's good. All judges. Now note this. So he brought the judiciary into it at the very beginning. All judges and city people and the craftsmen shall do what? On the what? Venerable day of the sun. So he mentions the venerable day of the sun because it is a day that the pagans understood as being significant or a day of worship or a day of focus. All right, now, note that date. That's 321. He takes the position first, but this position that he's taken is not religious. We have accused it of being religious, but it is not. It is the state instituting a rest day that has religious implications. He didn't say you have to go to church. Okay, I want you to stay with me on this, all right? He didn't say you got to go to church. He didn't say that you got to go worship. He didn't say we're going to take an offering. He didn't say any of that. He said you're going to rest. That was the end of the discussion. That's the same as the environmental focus. A rest. That's it. Then the church comes along behind it. And they do something. Watch what happens in the progression. You have this intentional commingling. Note this. After Constantine, his son, Constantius, came into power, in an effort to unite the various factions of the church, he forced an anti-Nicene doctrines of the church, saying, whatever I will shall be regarded as canon. Okay, now these boys are stretching out. Are they stretching out? Oh, yeah, they're stretching out. They're now exercising their power because now that they have changed the focus of the empire, now that they have incorporated a day of rest, forcing everybody to rest on the same day, they are now going to exercise more power that has religious implications. Note this. Constantius also tried to eliminate some pagan practices. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. 
He actually wanted to do something that was Christian. He wanted to eliminate some pagan practices from his empire. So in AD 356, now note this, that was 321. So 35 years later, he decreed the closure of all pagan temples. You think he was successful? No, not in Rome. The decree did not stop the rituals from, from continuing in Rome, all right? Constantius, cousin of Julius, or Julian rather, became the next emperor, a pagan he tried to, I should say it this way, Constantius, cousin Julian, became the next emperor, a pagan he tried to revert the empire now back to pre-Christian paganism. So you have Constantius who tries to take it into Christian, he tries to take it into Christianity, banning pagan temples, closing pagan temples. So now you have this back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Julian comes along and wants to take it back before Christianity into paganism. And they begin to worship Helios and Mithra. Mithra worship or Mithraism came from Medo-Persia. We'll get into this in the next sermon. All right, note this. Following the reign of Julian was the era of emperors who practiced some form of Christianity. Practice, what's that word? Form, some form of Christianity, but remained mostly tolerant to the heresies, to the what? And twisted doctrines that prevailed in their empire. All right? So now the church exploits, this is a key word, the church exploits the endorsement of the state. The Council of Laodicea was a regional synod of approximately 30 clerics. Now, here is where you see that the church has made a complete turn because when we were talking about the Word of God, the church never sat in a council to determine what was going to be in the Word of God. Now the church sits in a council to determine when people can worship. Do you see the difference? Okay, note this from Asia Minor that assembled about 363 to 364 AD in Laodicea. This is what they passed. And this is Canon 29. I don't think I put it in the next slide because I've got to close now, but Canon 29. Canon 29 goes down in history and we're gonna show you next week where the, the papacy, the Vatican, the Roman church says there are only two choices in this world, to be a Roman Catholic or to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Next week, I read it this morning. They make it clear there are only two religions in this world as far as they are concerned. They said if you're going to follow the Bible, be a Seventh-day Adventist. They said, but if not, you need to be a Roman Catholic. That's a strong statement. All right? And it's also a dividing line. Okay? Which means if you want to translate it, you're either with us or you're against us. Note this. All right? This is what they wrote, Canon 29. Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath. So what did they call it? Judaizing. They made it a Jewish day, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. So that's where that term comes from. That's where it originates. The Lord's day. This is when it originates. And if they can, resting then as Christians. If they can, resting as Christians. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers. All right, now watch this. So this is not only a day supporting this first day, or this is not only a law, Supporting the first day, it is a law that also counters the seventh. It says, if any be found to be Judaizers, which would mean keeping the seventh day Sabbath, let them be anathema from Christ. All right? What is anathema? It's taking and using the state to enforce, note this, a formal curse by a pope or a council of the church excommunicating a person or denouncing a doctrine. Here are your references, and we'll include that in the email that we will send to you, all right? Now, here's your official merger of church and state. Officially, church and state united in what we would say Western civilization in 538 A.D., 
when Emperor Justinian issued a decree proclaiming the Pope to be supreme in religious matters. That was taken literally, and he has been ruling ever since. Since then, the Pope has assumed the garb of representative of Jesus Christ on the earth. I want to close with this. I want to close with this. Paul foretells the rise of apostasy. And this is what he says. And this is written A.D. 51, 52. We just saw when that was enacted regarding the restrictions of the Council of Laodicea. This is what he wrote, A.D. 51, 52. Let that, let, let that no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there shall come a what? Falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is what? Called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? God, but he is not God. And so as we go into next week, in this ongoing series, we will talk about the great blackout and the blackout that affected all of Europe and the civilized world at that time. And see, here's what we have to keep in mind is that when the power was given to Rome, the papacy, when the papacy received this power from Justinian, it literally had the same reach as the Roman Empire. So wherever there was a Roman Empire, they could enforce these new laws. And that transitioned right through medieval Europe. So as we walk into this period that we're, I'm calling the blackout, and most of us have remembered it from school as the Dark Ages, which by the way, they no longer use. That term is no longer used. It's now just spoken of as medieval Europe. So there is not a blackout. But the Bible says that for 1260 years, beginning when 538 AD, that there would be a political, moral, but most of all, spiritual blackout. And we're going to talk about it beginning next week. Have you learned something today? We should never doubt the power of God through his word to answer all of our questions. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the promises of your word. May we never fear. May we never doubt. May we always trust. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want you to.